What XL learned from the way California shuts off power to prevent wildfires as customers unhappy about the power shutdowns this month vent to regulators tonight. Proof that Denver's old style homeless sweep this week had old style results. Just push people around the corner. Tonight, how many folks are still on the streets with the mayor's hotel shelters and micro communities full? A ringing endorsement for a one-of-a-kind instructor at DU. It's loud. <laughs> uh, you can hear it at least a couple of blocks. And a unique approach to preventing suicides by wrapping around the people who have just lost someone. A cause worth supporting together tonight on Next. XL is getting lit up right now for turning off the lights with little notice. State regulators are currently hearing from Coloradans impacted by Excel's decision to preemptively shut off power to 55,000 customers due to high winds. Our Marshall Zellinger found out that the way Excel notifies those customers of new safety shutdowns, that's likely to change. Unfair and arbitrary seems to be the uh, vibe of the day. Throughout the outage, um, our, our neighborhood never even appeared on the outage map. Nick and Ben before him are among the 170 who signed up to tell Excel's regulators, the Public Utilities Commission, that Excel's communication about power shutoffs was far from excellent. Due to short notice and unclear communication from Excel Energy, many members of our business community suffered economic hardship. Excel customers looking for maps of where the power might be shut off did not find them provided by Excel. In a strange game of email telephone, South Metro Fire got this map that was originally sent from Excel to a community in Douglas County, at least according to the email chain. Customers seeking this information from Excel went on social media with less than excellent feedback. A. Ginny wrote to Excel on Facebook, why do you not have a proactive map? Excel responded, our electric outage map shows the areas and how many customers are affected. Johnny wrote, you should consider the people on medical devices, such as CPAP and oxygen. Excel responded, you should have a household backup plan in place for use of your medical equipment should a disruption of utility service occur. Excel's current wildfire mitigation plan references PSPS, public safety power shutoffs. While the company currently does not utilize PSPS, it is working to evaluate the cost and how such a plan might be implemented in the future for our Colorado system. Excel also writes that in 2022, company executives visited two California power companies to learn about their processes for PSPS. One of those is Pacific Gas and Electric, PG&E. Here is that company's required communication for public safety power shutoffs. Two days before, customers get their first warning. One day before, a second warning. And if the PSPS is not canceled, one to four hours before the power is shut off, customers get a final warning. Then they're notified once the power is shut off. It's almost like looking west, we can predict the future. I think, yeah, I'm looking west. The Public Utilities Commission in California has created these fire threat maps. They show tiers of where there's a fire threat. The red are the extreme fire threat areas. Clearly, I don't need to circle them all because you can see red versus yellow. That's the elevated fire threat areas. And I see a future in Colorado, Kyle, where this map will determine future power shutoff areas in Colorado. Basically, if you live in a red area and it's windy, expect the power shut off. You know, Marshall, this starts to get into the territory that they're already in in California, where when you're looking at, say, buying a house, you're going to have to consider, will I be able to insure this home because of, of where it is in the, in the urban wildland fire interface? Will I deal with power shutoffs all the time? It's going to become a fact of life. Which goes to one of the feedback, uh, pieces of feedback that the PUC got from someone who is a former Boulder City Council person who's saying, what about the root cause? Is Excel going to do anything about, hey, building infrastructure that can withstand 100 mile per hour winds so that you don't have to shut off the power, so that this is not the solution, but rather building the infrastructure that can withstand where we're at now in our climate. Underground lines, everybody says, very expensive. Marshall, thank you. Democrats at the state capitol are pushing through so many gun control bills at once, the legislature is debating several of them today. House Appropriations Committee moved along a new 9% excise tax on firearms and ammo, money that would be used for crime victim services. House Appropriations also gave approval to a bill requiring gun dealers to get a new state-issued permit that would have requirements above and beyond the federal rules. And within the past hour, Another House committee began debate on a bill that would prohibit concealed carry in public spaces like college campuses and would also ban legislators from carrying a firearm on the Capitol grounds. 
As Colorado prepares to reflect on 25 years since the Columbine school shooting, remembering those lost decades ago, there is a sickening rise in indecency toward the families of mass shooting victims and survivors. In Colorado and across the country, we are seeing ghoulish mockery of victims' families from extremists who are increasingly mainstream in conservative politics and the gun rights movement. As we have said here previously, this is not about gun policy or how you feel about firearms. This is an issue of human decency, and it's the kind of degeneracy that would have been universally condemned after the Columbine school shooting 25 years ago, but is celebrated by some now. It's a talk show host claiming the Sandy Hook shooting was a hoax. And instead of becoming a pariah, Alex Jones became an ally of an American president. It's a conspiracy theorist harassing teenage survivors of a school shooting, then leveraging that into a successful run for Congress, where Marjorie Taylor Greene is one of the most powerful Republicans in the House. This month here in Colorado, the gun rights group Rocky Mountain Gun Owners taunted Tom Sullivan, suggesting that the man who lost his child to a mass murder and is now a member of the state legislature, was about to fly off in a homicidal rage. And this week, the week of remembrances for the Columbine school shooting, when Tom Mauser will share stories of his son Daniel. Mauser was told by a prominent gun rights activist in Colorado, Alicia Garcia, that he needs to stop exploiting the death of his son. Her social media post ordered him to heal yourself of your demons. Grief turned into advocacy is not demonic. But what term should we use for the people who taunt and mock parents who have gone through the worst loss imaginable? The people who know that that kind of cruelty can now help propel them to fame and power in America, 25 years after Columbine. Denver's lofty goal to move people out of street encampments and into individual shelter is currently on pause because those beds are full. So the city is back to doing sweeps the old way, clean up one area and just kind of chase people on to the next. Our Marshal, uh, our Mar Mark Salinger, not Marshall Zellinger, not the first time I've confused him, but our Mark Salinger set out to answer a difficult question today. Just how many people are still living on Denver streets after a thousand were moved indoors? These folks just arrived here yesterday. This is what happens when people are forced to move from one block to the next. Take off this. Come on, come on. Food, I, I, tents, and people with nowhere else to go pile up right down the street from where they were told they weren't allowed to be. We are just a few blocks away from the sweep that occurred yesterday where they uh, made 150 people move. Amy Beck is an advocate for people experiencing homelessness. She was there yesterday as the city swept to camp at 8th and Calumet. For the first time under the Johnson administration, housing was not offered to people living there. Today, many of them set up camp nearby. And even Mayor Johnson has said himself that there is no point in moving people just around the corner or a couple of blocks away. Amy but yet, is right. You know, the reason why the previous uh, challenges have not been solved is because we cannot move people off of one block. If they have no place to go, they end up just on the next block. Mayor Mike Johnston told us in July he didn't want to follow his predecessor's plan of sweeping people from one corner to another. But now that his administration has moved more than 1,400 people indoors, they're out of space. He knows what happens next. When you are not offering those folks someplace to go in the form of housing, all they can do is take their stuff and move to the next block. The city has decommissioned 11 encampments in September, offering shelter to 930 people living there. At 8th and Logan, the spot where a camp used to be is now a parking lot. At 20th and Champa, rocks now cover the sidewalks people used to sleep on. And at 22nd and Stout, there's nothing really going on anymore. It's good that we were able to move a thousand people off of the streets. Here, I got another box, wait up. But back here off Calumath Street, this new camp shows what happens when people are told to leave with nowhere else to go. There are so many more people on the streets. So how many people are still living on the streets? It's hard to know. The most recent count that we could find was taken in January of 2023, a full year and a half ago almost. There were more than 1,400 people in Denver then living on the streets, but that's before the city started offering people housing, Kyle. 
The mayor says these old style sweeps are not effective. They don't want to do them unless it's the last resort. So when is that going to be next? We don't know. We asked what camps are you sweeping next? Where are they going to be? Didn't get that answer. All right, Mark Salinger, thank you. Advocates in Larimer County say that they are seeing a reduction in the suicide rate, like few places in Colorado can claim these days. Despite that progress in saving lives, they know that they're still losing too many of their neighbors to suicide, which is why one nonprofit is pivoting to also help suicide loss survivors, knowing that those who are grieving the loss of a suicide are at greater risk for suicide themselves. This week's Word of Thanks microgiving campaign is supporting the Alliance for Suicide Prevention in Larimer County. The stars on the wall of their office bear the names of those lost, those remembered. It's the nonprofit's Survivors Benefit Project that we are helping out this week. It covers the basic financial needs of Coloradans who have recently lost someone to suicide. Help paying for rent or a mortgage, groceries, child care. The program helps to pay for funerals and cremation pays for therapy, either with their own specialized in-house provider or somebody else. And even, and this is kind of tough to talk about, but it, it is essential, the Survivors Benefits Project pays for cleanup services, and that allows people to return to a home where somebody that they love took their own life. Scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491 to get that link to donate. You know I'll never ask you to give to a cause unless I support it myself. And you've proven that even $5 donations add up fast. So as always, I'll match the first 50 donations of five bucks. More than 2,000 of you have signed up to simplify your giving with a monthly donation to the Word of Thanks Fund. Monthly supporters have become the foundation of what we do, starting each microgiving campaign off last month with more than $15,000. You can use the same QR code or text to get there. This helicopter could get anywhere in Colorado within about an hour. Um, that's the kind of resources we need. Well, it could hypothetically. Uh, next viewers already know the truth about the helicopter at today's firefighting photo op. That thing has sat grounded for years, costing taxpayers millions. And it is the loudest instrument you have likely never heard of, clanging away at DU with students learning how to work the controls. A $24 million helicopter outfitted to fight fires in Colorado has yet to do its job once. The state's Firehawk has sat unused for more than a year because of technical delays. But that didn't stop state leaders from showing it off at a press conference today before media outlets that may or may not be aware that that thing's never been used. Behind me, you can see the much anticipated Firehawk. Firehawk helicopter. The Firehawk, Firehawk, the Firehawk, the Firehawk, the second Firehawk. Firehawk's a, a hot topic. Now, you know that the thing has never flown because this week we reported that that Firehawk helicopter purchased in 2021 still is not operational. State fire managers have run into all kinds of issues an engine recall, problems with the water tank, delays with certification. But just like your spouse on the way out to dinner, they swear they're almost ready. Should be fully operational by early next month. Governor defended the decision to buy the helicopter, plus a second one the state now has. He says the old way of doing it with a helicopter shared across several states isn't going to cut it as wildfires become more common across the West. A beautiful day, a nice break between storms, but now the clouds are rolling in. Yet another weather change that will mean scattered mountain snow showers and rain and snow showers for the drive tomorrow morning. The showers will move in late tonight, but we remain cool and unsettled all the way through early Saturday. And the Front Range and Denver could see that rain mixing with snow overnight tonight and again on Friday night. The leading edge of the most recent system coming in from the north, so a little light snow showing up on Vail Pass and near Steamboat. A few light showers showers on that I-76 corridor. Temperatures today in the 80s across the eastern plains, low 70s in downtown Denver. That wind is starting to kick up over some of the higher passes to 20 and 30 miles per hour. And because of the wind and the warmth, concerns for fire danger in southern Colorado with the red flag warning that remains in effect, Colorado Springs, Pueblo, Walsenburg, and Trinidad. This next system will roll through quickly, but the next one's quick on the heels to come in Friday into Saturday. And that means even though we're not looking at a cumulative 
accumulation. You may have a few snow showers flying around for the drive tomorrow morning and again late Friday into Saturday. The big thing I think you'll notice is the temperatures. 60s and 50s this evening, but as you look ahead, our high tomorrow on Thursday, only 50. Mid 50s with showers Friday, 51 on Saturday with a chance for rain and snow. And then off we go to sunshine and 70s for Sunday, Monday and Tuesday. I've been doing this for a long time, so I'm kind of used to the feeling of controlling the soundscape for a neighborhood. Each day, he plays to an audience he never sees whether they want to hear his performance or not. The man in DU's bell tower is passing on his craft to a new generation. Next. DU's gold bell tower is its signature, and the carillon inside is the campus's signature sound. One of only a few hundred instruments like it with a very select few who know how to make it ring. It sounds like there's a lot more tradition when you hear them going off. Now, a lot of people have heard carillons or heard bells. They don't quite know what's going on in the tower. You'd think there'd be some sort of key involved that you're playing, um, and then that translates to really loud gong bells playing. Let's see. I'm Joey Brink. I'm the university carillonist and adjunct professor of carillon, which means I play the bells and teach bells. So a carillon is a keyboard instrument, and it plays bells. What was it called again? Caroline? Caroline. 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 Nice. <laughs> So we have 65 bells in the tower. The smallest bell is only 20 pounds, but the biggest bell is 12,000 pounds. I've been doing this for a long time, so I'm kind of used to the feeling of controlling the soundscape for a neighborhood. Do you remember how to find a C? Ah, oh, shoot, it's this one. Yes. Okay. My name is Ella, and I'm a junior. I'm playing the carillon. 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 And this note compared to where it was? I think it's something that's really unique to the campus and just kind of makes us stand out. Okay, so that's F, so then that's G. E, because you're going backwards. Crap. E, okay. Yeah, you're good. So when I figured out it was like a class I could take and I could learn how to play it, I thought it'd be cool to try. Exactly. It's, it's nice to look forward to, and it helps me also know if I'm running late to things, but in like a nice way. <laughs> People are often surprised when I tell them that this is actually a growing art form. The art form is growing, and it's exciting to be able to continue that growth. And now next time you hear it, you'll know. We're back with your feedback next. The folks who run the Alliance for Suicide Prevention in Larimer County are proud of that county's drastic reduction in their suicide rate, yet they know more can be done. They also know that the funding is out there for suicide prevention, not suicide postvention. I mean, what does that even mean, right? It's helping people who have already lost somebody to suicide, people who are then at, at risk, increased risk of suicide themselves. Our Word of Thanks campaign is going to support the nonprofit Survivors Benefit Program. It offers cleanup services, help with rent, groceries, child care, free therapy for suicide loss survivors. To join me in supporting them, scan the QR code on your screen or text the word thanks to 303-871-1491. Fran in Commerce City wrote in to say being able to return to our home after her mother took her life there without having to deal with all of that because somebody took care of the cleanup, she said that was one of the biggest things for her family. Dan in Broomfield says, impressive commentary on the mockery of mass shooting victims and their families these days. Dan writes, how sad that we need to call out stupidity and cruelty. We do need to call it out because there is a big appetite and audience for it out there these days and somebody has to say no.